Um, I'm going to give you a very sort of hands-on uh, perspective today. Um, I've called it a journey across continents and across time. I've been doing this for a while. I don't look this way just from one ERP implementation. This took at least three. Um, and I want to talk about practically how do you do it. So these are my footprints as a CIO. I started in North America and slowly moved east over time. What I want to say to you is prepare you by saying this. For digitization, we will struggle. There is no doubt about it. And we will fail. But the only way that failing is fatal is to stop. I taught psychology at the University of Toronto for 14 years. And I know that kids fail until they pass. And we're no different. We will work together to digitize CIS in partnerships with other governments, businesses, and people. So I want to go through the last 25 years of my life as I did this. And it's an operational and on the ground perspective. There's five takeaways. It's all about people. The people are in the government, in businesses, and individuals. Progress is uneven. Someone is always lagging. And you have to learn, as someone who's on the ground, that even though you're lagging, you have to create a self-sustaining model so you can keep going when someone else isn't able to keep going. And my favorite saying in IT is, failure plus a good excuse is not success in the eyes of the customer. I don't want this ever. And I get it all the time. So we can't know exactly what the digital journey is in CIS. What we do know is there's always going to be positive choices when we fail. So I'm going to list some of the things. I actually started with about 30 items, and I've reduced it to less than 10. These are the things that I found I struggled with. It's the institutional culture. When I started doing this with SAP in Toronto in the 1990s, IT was simply seen as a cost. We had in-house software, and we spent less than 1% of our salary and benefits budget on training IT staff. Now, how much did we spend on a piece of technology? We spent 20% of the purchase price a year in some cases, or with SAP, 28% of the price. And yet our most expensive cost is people. And that's the lowest cost we have for upkeep of the people. Training is the service for people to keep them current. I moved then to um, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and London, England, as Russell said, because Russell followed me. It was a multi-country, once again, untrained IT, less than 1%. In all of these countries, I've had to build the IT organization. They tend to be legacy. They tend to be untrained. And they tend to be unmentored. As a CIO, I have three jobs. I serve the institution. I lead the organization. And I co-manage the careers of the people who work for me. I invest an incredible amount of time with that. And it always pays off. I think partly what I found was IT was still seen as a cost. I had a hard time in some of these countries finding what are the incentives for change. In North America, it was Y2K. We were all scared silly. And if Y2K hadn't happened, there'd be no ERP surge, and SAP wouldn't be as rich as it is, and neither would PeopleSoft or Oracle or any of them. We ran before the wave that didn't exist. So the institutional culture was a killer in each of these places and something to be overcome. So when I came here, I found a strong vision from two presidents. President Nazarbayev, the first president of Kazakhstan, and Shigeo Katsu, 
the former vice president of the World Bank, who's the president of Nazarbayev. And they had a vision, but we were crippled by in-house systems. IT, once again, was seen as a cost, and only a cost. It wasn't seen as a lever or a lever to move the organization. It was just like electricity. You want to pay as little for it as possible and resent the fact that the IT people are among the most expensive people in your organization if you're paying them properly. And I have this to say to you, if you don't want to pay them, get out of the business because you're not going to be successful. In all of these places, income was a barrier. And you see what happens in the non-US, non-North American world. In the North American world, we earned in dollars, we paid in dollars. Pakistan, East Africa, we earned in shillings and rupees, and we paid in dollars. Here we earn in tenge, and we pay in dollars. Can you imagine how many patient interactions we had to do in Karachi? to pay for North American software. It was incredible. If we had loaded the cost on them, we would have lost half our patients. As it was, we were doing 72% of them as charity patients. They would have all been charity patients. The software in North America, I can remember having successions of presidents complain to me, the amount you're spending on this, I could build a building. Saying, yes, you can. You could build a building, you'd be as badly served today with more square footage. So what was a big issue in North America became a giant issue when I went to Africa. Because we had no idea in Pakistan how to pay for this at all. The dawn of the ERP surge for us was an answer to a con constant problem, and as it is here, and I'll talk about the answer in a minute. So our recent history always affects you. In North America, it was slow growth. It was low risk. Had it not been for Y2K, we would never have done this. We didn't understand the difference between buying and building. Uh, University of Toronto was one of the first SAP people in North America. The next one was MIT. And I used to have an ongoing battle with Jim Bruce, who was then the CIO there, saying, Jim, you got several hundred modifications to SAP. How is that going to work? And I know that because when I got to Stanford, they had modified the core code of Oracle. And when I said to the president, we can't go live, he said, would $10 million help? And I said, no, the hole would just get deeper. We had to actually stop the project. We didn't understand that when you buy software, you buy not only a what, but a how. It does it a certain way. And I don't care that it's not the way you did it before. If you bought it, you like it. You wouldn't rewrite the inside of Outlook, the, the guts of Outlook or Word, but you tried it. So you can't buy yourself out of a problem. When I got to Asia, and Africa, there was a beautiful history of creativity in Africa that surprised me. I did not know that Africa decided at some point not to put in copper for phones. They leapt right to wireless. And they had leapt right to M-Pesa when I got there. They had better penetration of online payments than in many places in North America. So there were leaps in development. There were more smartphones I discovered when I started to do blended learning in Africa than any place else. And I didn't have to train the people how to do it. They knew how to do it because that was how they lived. Because they were creative, because they had to be. And that was their incentive. They had to be. In North America, we had not much more incentive than Y2K. As a matter of fact, what I did find is the more famous the university, the more resistant it was to change. You know, we got, what got us here will keep us here. Well, it might, but it won't get you there. And that was the lesson for North American universities. When I came here, it was um, a surprise, I think, when I looked, started looking at the culture in my own IT organization. I had people terrified to make a mistake. 
people told me that there was financial police who would come to them and take them away if they made a mistake. And like every other university I was in, they're drowning in data and starving for information. We didn't know what we didn't know. And we didn't know ourselves. And that was true at every university I've worked at. So in, in edu education, North America, the general population was educated. In Africa and Asia, it was stratified. Some were well-educated, some were not. Same true as here. In all cases, IT education was ignored. And I will say this. If you don't have long, lifelong learning in your country, in your university, how the heck do you plan to live in a world where a generation in IT is still 18 months? Things happen so rapidly, and we think we bring the kids in, we take their heads off, stuff the data in, put the skull back together, and say, have a nice life. And that's not a way to run a university, and it's not a way to run an IT organization. So reinvention, it comes from people, from educated people. And if you don't educate them, you're not going to get it. So in North America, it was really slow reinvention. When I was in Canada and the US, most of the creativity came from sort of hot spots outside the university, not from inside the university. I mean, computer science being the one example where you did get reinvention. But had we not done EHR, sorry, we, had we not done the new administrative systems, we wouldn't have discovered business process reengineering. When we discovered business process reengineering, then we changed the organizations, and we understand why we wanted these packages. In Toronto, we eliminated 40% of the effort in purchasing just by implementing software. So. Here, in CIS, the perception of government controls is constricting, and it limits creativity, because you can't be creative if you're afraid you'll be wrong. And it's OK to be wrong. Information technology alignment, IT was seen as a cost, and it was aligned with administration, not with a core business. In each case that I've been at, it was Finance serving the financial people, serving the HR people. It wasn't, it wasn't mapped to teaching, learning, patient care, innovation, research. It saw that as trivial off to one side instead of core. Self-determination, owning your own future. That seems like a weird one. But it's actually core, because if you don't know who you are and what you do, you can't possibly change. And for all of us, our history has been buried in our data for years, and we've not understood what we were doing. Security focus. I got to tell you, when I was in Toronto, those were the good old days. I didn't realize that. And security has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. I started out as a CIO maybe spending 1% of my time worried about security. Once GDPR came, when I still was at AKU, I was spending 40 to 50% of my time on it, trying to figure out, ignoring hacking. I was just, GDPR was just prevention of hacking because we had seven hospitals with an unknown number of European Union people in the hospitals, and we never tracked their home information in their home country and yet we were financially at risk. And what I will say is, AI is my biggest risk as a CIO. And what I'm hoping is, I've just been asked to be part of an AI group inside Kazakhstan. I sure hope that we can develop an AI-based system that will automatically protect us like an immune system. We need something that's as Constructive as AI can be destructive. Disruption. In North America, from my experience, there was no disruption. There was just replication. We need to disrupt ourselves. I worked for 
PWC and Coopers and Librand, and I constantly got told, no, we don't need that faster way of doing it because we charge by the hour. And I said to them, if we don't eat our lunch, they'll eat our lunch. There's disruption all over. Look at Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, and Amazon, and how it's changed the market. Brain drain. This is the nightmare, right? And I got to tell you, I just got used to it. I'm constantly hiring people because as soon as I train them, they leave. The CFO and the CIO are running on the track. And the CFO says, Chris, I wish you would stop training people because they leave. They're very expensive. And Chris says, yeah, but when I don't train them, they stay. So how do you contract, how do you deal with the brain drain? You can't, you just got to adapt to it. And you've got to ensure that you pay them proper salaries. I've been raising salaries. I, we now, every time I do a budget, at least 5 to 6% is on training and education for the IT staff. And I treat employees as well as I can because slavery was abolished a while ago. They don't have to stay. They only stay because they want to stay. And I was asked actually to come up with some ideas about what we could do. In CIS, let's try to standardize. There's no unique way, no Kazakh way, no Kyrgyz way, no Pakistani way, no North American way that's so unique. No university became famous for having the best payroll system. Just use the regular stuff. Use international enabling tools. For university, we have research and education networks that's in most countries. When we do that, it facilitates intercommunication and sharing. And I think we need to build regional coalitions. Thank you very much.